This is so exciting. We tried to have this program last year, uh, which meant we'd been thinking about it since the June before that. And um, there were a couple reasons why we couldn't do it, including there was Judy, and they were also filming, what is it, Bird? Bird Box. Bird Box. Um, Sandra, oh. Bullock. Sandra Bullock movie. They were filming here, taking advantage of the students being gone. So I welcome Rembrandt Club members. Um, it's very great to see all your familiar faces. And here come some more people. They'll have to sit on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if they're willing. So just, yeah, just a couple of uh, Little bits of fine art foundation business. I'm Beth Benjamin, I'm the president. And um, really, just be sure that you've signed the mailing list if you'd like to get our e-newsletter because there's some things coming up that you might be interested in. We're doing a series on art conservation. There'll be three lectures, which is sort of an offshoot of a program we did two years ago, or last year, um, on art conservation. So I guess all I can say about that is sign up on the membership list. And after we have our talk, then we'll have tea out there in the courtyard. And this is just the weather that I ordered. Um, yeah, I've been looking at the 10 days for a long time. So I'm going to introduce Sally, who's on our board, Sally Monastery, who was a Scripps graduate. And so she will introduce Judy. Thank you. Well, I've known Judy longer than any of us want to admit to, <laughs> uh, except for maybe Julia. <laughs> um, and she taught me a lot about being at Scripps. After she graduated, Judy went on to um, Washington. University of Washington. And got her library science degree, and then ended up at the Library of Congress, and slowly moved her way back to the West Coast. Um, where she got, she was at Honnold first, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then became the director of, um, followed a long line of eminent librarians at the Scripps College Library, and retired from that a couple of years Two ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. So, it, and I, there's probably no one on campus that has the institutional memory that, that Judy has from her long her long association with the college. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Judy Harvey Saha. Thank you, Sally. That, that long institutional memory is getting shorter <laughs> and shorter, and I need lots of mnemonic devices <laughs> to, um, to remind me of what's going on. I am absolutely delighted. I'm sorry that you have to sit on a carpet table but uh, delighted to see so many people here today. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, if she's here, um, there is a brand new director here at Denison who's this is her second day. <laughs> her name is Jennifer Martinez. And Jennifer, where are you? Is she here? She may not. <laughs> and she is a Scripps alum. And I have a feeling that many of you all will be uh, needing to use the library or see her about something. But she'll probably be in. And Duran Boyle, who helped me with the PowerPoint and who sort of keeps this place glued together, just left. So. <laughs> um, we also have to. Sir, back here, would you, no you, I'm sorry, could you flick these switches, these lights? Good. I think the ones up there. How did people wear hats? I feel like this one is falling off. Anyway, it's cute though. Um, oh, Jennifer, are you here? Well, Jennifer's here, Jennifer Martinez is here. And, uh, <laughs> That's the spirit. Great. And Duran? Oh, I was I introduced you, but you left. So <laughs> and said some uh, true things about you. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, I've 
also have a one other thing to add to Sally's introduction. I am the most technologically inept <laughs> person in this room. Yay. Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, this morning, um, what happened to me is what anyone who gives a talk that they write out never wants to happen. I lost it. Um, it's somewhere in the laptop on my kitchen table, I think, but I'm not sure. Um, so I did have notes. So this was going to deliberately be a bit of an overview. So it still is going to be an overview. I was hoping, and now I implore you to ask questions at the end because that's where we're going to spend most of our time, I think. <laughs> um, so I have been familiar with the Fine Arts Foundation since 1980, just a couple of years ago, when I was asked to serve on the board of the Fine Arts Foundation as the college representative. And there are a couple of people here that I knew then. The college representative brought concerns of the college to the board and vice versa. During the very rewarding decade I was on the board, I worked with some very dedicated, hardworking, strong, smart, and spunky women. I admired them tremendously. A year or so ago, when asked to speak on the history of fine arts, I thought to myself, well, I already know all about it. That's not going to be a problem. Well, I was really wrong. Um, after research in the fine arts archives, that is part of the Scripps College archives, I am in awe of the scope of the documentation that this group has maintained during the years and the extent to which the material chronicles the role of this organization in fostering an appreciation for art, not just at Scripps, but in Claremont and Southern California. Right now, I want to make a plea for additions to the archive. If you have material in your garage, or under your bed or in a cupboard um, that pertains to the Fine Arts Foundation and you wish to add it to the archives, please do so. I'm sure Jennifer and or Duran would be more than happy to speak with you. Um, so my talk today on fine arts history is not always chronological. It's not, not at all, in fact. Here is a poem written by Richard Armour for the 50th anniversary of the Fine Arts Foundation in May of 1985. Most of you know or have heard of Richard Armour, right? Good. Um, he was a professor here at Scripps, dean of faculty. He taught medieval English. Chaucer was his specialty. But what he really loved doing, and people loved reading, were his light uh, verse and uh, short articles in the Reader's Digest and his sm small books about anything and everything. Uh, in 1985, Armour wrote of the Fine Arts Foundation, now is the time for the celebration on the first 50 years of the Fine Arts Foundation. Inspired by that genius of art, Millard Sheets, performer of many incredible feats, and pushed onward and upward by Betty Wood, Irma Palmer, and others who understood what it takes to found and start to raise what today well deserves all support and praise. Based at Scripps, with its members completely devoted to painting and sculpture, and let it be noted, ceramics, mixed media, your art and mine, in fact, all arts just as long as they're fine. The Fine Arts Foundation has helped needy students and helped members too when, with taste and with prudence, they have listened to lectures, seen artists at work, and enjoyed modern art that since drove them berserk. Indeed, all who knew it without hesitation can say of fine arts, oh, how firm a foundation. <laughs> that is. Uh, Richard Armour, and he gives a little bit of a capsule history of, of the organization. Um, and I think I've forgotten, no. 
So we could say it all started with Millard. Richard Armour had a lot, several books. It all started with Eve. It all started with Nudes, which was a history of art. It all started with Hippocrates, uh, clever, light, nonsense. Um, um, books on on pieces of, of history. So this is Millard and his wife Mary, taken probably at about the time he was uh, founding the Fine Arts Foundation or helped to find. What Millard Sheets says, and I think it's mostly true, the archival record bears it out, he came to Scripps when he was very young, 19, in 1932, and he taught for a year. He was asked to stay longer, and he said, I cannot teach in a classroom where they teach philosophy and French. I have to have a proper studio and uh, build me a barn, please. And the president of the college thought, ah, well, he forgot about the barn, but he said, ah, more art at Scripps. Art at Scripps, that's a fine idea. President Jaqua, Ernest J. Jaqua, was, well, Scripps at that point was only uh, seven years old. It, the Depression had, was full blast underway. There needed to be something unique about Scripps College, and he thought there's no real good art anywhere else in Claremont. Maybe art could be Scripps's unique contribution to the consortium. So he started <coughs> talking to board, uh, board of trustee members and also to other advisors about the possibility of founding an organization that would help build that, not only build the building for Millard, but also give money for scholarships and faculty salaries. And of course, that would help out the Scripps budget. Uh, so he got together with several people particularly. One was um, Irene Gerlinger, who was a Jaqua family friend from Portland, Oregon, who was a, an advisor to institutions on fundraising. Another was Virginia Judy Esterly, who was a sociologist and a scholar, but she was all primarily Jake was assistant and counselor to the president. She basically administered the college while he was finding money. Um, Josephine Everett, who was a uh, lived in Pasadena, was an art collector and a longtime friend of the college, and Millard. And they got together, they talked to the board, and in 1935, the board approved of a group to fundraise for art at Scripps. Um, the objective of the Fine Arts Foundation has varied in its wording over the years, but essentially it is this. The Fine Arts Foundation is founded for the purpose of stimulating public interest in art and of developing greater opportunities for the study of art at Scripps College through funds secured by memberships and gifts and the endowment of scholarships in the art field. Um, so Millard was um, quite excited about having the possibility of a, of a new building and was very grateful for having a foundation to help raise money. And this is in 1985. This is his um, remembrance of how it all came about. This is the logo for Barking Rocks, which was his retirement home up in Guala. Well, wherever that is, in Montecito. Um, so at his, he, and he does say at the um, second fine arts meeting, he, he described his dream of what art at Scripps should look like. He charmed the ladies. He um, talked about enthusiastic students. And he was approached by a winter visitor from Montclair, New Jersey, 
whose name, well, it turns out to be Florence Rand Lang. At that time, she wanted to be anonymous. She gave an anonymous gift of $30,000. Would you like $30,000 to build your building or one of your buildings? And he said, yes, thank you. And um, however, there's never enough money. So a couple of years later, construction was underway. The studio was complete. And Millard sent a letter well, I'll, I think I'll leave that. That is uh, the Lang Gallery, which is now Malott Commons, um, shortly after it was built. And in probably 1937, Millard sent a letter to the board of the Fine Arts Foundation. And I'm going to read the whole thing because it's very, very Millard sheets. And it also says a lot. I am very happy to be unable, I am very, so can I start over? I'm very sorry, there's quite a difference, to be un unable to attend your meeting on Tuesday, February 3rd, as I am giving a talk at the Biltmore Bowl. I had planned to come to the meeting to tell you about the state of the art department and its needs. I hope that you will be pleased with the progress to date regarding our new exhibition space, storeroom, etc., and that you are not too shocked by the explanation of our immediate needs. In other words, we really need money, and I'm going to tell you about it. We have received to date $5,000 from Mrs. So-and-so, a trustee of Scripps. In addition, we have received approximately $4,400 from so-and-so and another trustee and her brother. This money will cover all costs of excavation, ground floor in the new gallery, stone stairways, and most of the planting in the new garden. The entire project, including all other developments relating to the new Chinese garden and new gallery, lighting, heating, floor treatment, ceilings, etc., will probably cost in the neighborhood of about $15,000. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, uh, membership dues were $100 a piece, which is, I don't, I'm not an economist, but it's probably way over $1,000 now. Um, he said, we have in hand of this $15,000, approximately a total of 9,400, which he had just detailed. In other words, for an additional $5,000 expense, we will gain a new exhibition gallery that would cost at least $35,000 to build, plus a magnificent oriental garden, which will be extremely useful for fine arts foundation occasions, <laughs> garden parties, etc., and expand our present exhibition space an additional 100%. I have purposely avoided bringing any small questions to your attention during the past year, knowing eventually we would need some real help. As you can see from the above statement, the moment has arrived. I would greatly appreciate the appointment of a committee by your board to assist me in the eventual raising of money for the new gallery. I am sincerely certain that it will be of such great value to your foundation as well as the college that I can ask you to do your part. I, can on I am only sorry that I am not there to see the enthusiastic look on your faces when you read this. <laughs> was both Millard Sheets and uh, Ernest J. Jaqua, the president, had had a bit of a way with the ladies. Okay, by May of 1937, more than half the students, this is data, half of the students at Scripps were enrolled in classes taught in the studio facility, painting, design, architecture, ceramic design, metal craft, uh, costume design, and weaving. By March 1938, Florence Rand Lang had pledged an additional gift that brought her contribution to the fine arts facility at Scripps to $75,000. Um, what year? 
1938. So that's quite a remarkable gift from some anonymous, and Millard referred to her as a little lady, and, um, oh, wait a second, this is she. This is Florence Rand Lang from Montclair, New Jersey. Um, and this is Malvina, I think her name was, Malvina Hoffman, who was a sculptor who had worked with Albert Stewart in New York. And when it came time to dedicate the uh, Lang Art Gallery, um, she came to give a series of talks in Redlands, in Pasadena, and in Claremont, which was a very, I think, very clever and very wise use of her time. And the man in the middle is President Ernest J. Jaqua. And in the question and answer period, ask me about the haunted president's house and remember his hands and his pockets, okay? <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you now, <laughs> which I just did though, didn't I? Anyway, she, um, at the time she gave the extra money, she wrote, having seen how much the art building at Scripps is being used and seeing the need for large facilities, I will be glad to give for such a purpose. And she agreed to no longer be anonymous. Her building was dedicated um, in March of 1939. And this is one of my favorite photographs of art, of Lang art, um, with some beautiful um, architectural details. The building was designed by Gordon Kaufman, who designed all of the uh, most of the other original um, buildings on campus. One of the most important aspects of the Fine Arts Foundation program for 80 years has been the speaker and lecture offerings. They were meant to, and I think did, develop an appreciation for art on the campus and in the community. I truly believe that the Fine Arts Foundation, through its speaker series and other programs, had, has done as much as any other entity to, or did, and still ha is, establish Claremont as a center of, of art and art creativity in um, Southern California. The uh, speaker program depended quite a lot on faculty. In this particular ex um, photograph, uh, there are some scripts, art faculty. Um, this is Douglas McClellan, uh, with whom you might be familiar. This is Alan Blizzard, the painter. This is Paul Solner, the ceramicist. And this twinkly-eyed fellow here is Paul Darrow. Uh, and all of them, including Aldo Casanova and Millard Sheets and William Manker early on, uh, any great number, Rick Pedersen, uh, Rick, uh, any number of Scripps faculty and art, uh, art faculty and art historians gave gave talks, and from the wider community, um, Carl Benjamin, the painter, uh, gave a fine arts talk, at least one, and as did Sam Maloof. Um, there have also been uh, artists, other artists, other authors, critics, um, actors, uh, for example, Ray Bradbury in the spring of 1971 gave a talk. His daughter had attended Scripps. Francois G Gillot um, talked on life with Picasso. She came with her husband, Dr. Jonas Salk. I believe that was in about 1973. Uh, the Fine Arts Foundation has attracted a good many notable people to, to speak. In 1974-75, the food critic of the LA Times talked about an exhibit that was current called Food as Fine Art. The same year, the Fine Arts Foundation reissued its cookbook. And I brought my two personal Fine Arts Foundation cookbooks. If anyone would like to look at them after the talk, they're right here. 
Um, the Claremont Courier interviewed Lois Dewan, uh, who was the critic, and later reported on the day. Lunch was a buffet affair featuring creamed chicken, brownish rice, <laughs> a lime jello salad, and tiny pastries for dessert. Mrs. Duan did not attend the luncheon. <laughs> oh. Of course, part of the programs were lunches. And a number of them, uh, of course, and, and the monthly teas. Um, let's see. There were also, in addition to regularly scheduled meetings, there was a div there were dividends, what they called dividend meetings. And for example, in March of 1971, there was a full day on campus of workshops, this was on a Saturday, workshops, classes, demonstrations led by Scripps Art faculty for Fine Arts Foundation members. And later in the decade, in um, the 70s, many, M-I-N-I, -I, many courses were conducted by art and art history faculty teaching printmaking, wrapping Christmas presents, um, <laughs> macrame, and other, as the time went on, the Christmas presents were left behind and more serious subjects were, were covered. Um, museum tours, of course. Oh, there's the... There's a luncheon over in Wilbur, if you all remember that banquet hall. And uh, here is a typical tea. This tea pot, actually is there one, in, there is not one in front of the woman. This tea pot was, I believe, designed and uh, thrown by um, Rick Pedersen. Um, it is in the permanent collections of the college. I don't think you can still serve tea in it. I wouldn't want it, but that's beside the point. Um, so the Fine Arts Foundation, in addition to its speakers and its uh, teas and its program and courses, they had museum tours at least for a year. Um, they went all over Southern California to the Getty Museum, the Huntington, Palm Springs, Apple Valley, the Bowers Museum. Uh, in fact, one year in 1974, in January, they planned a um, an exhibit, uh, a two gallery tour in San Francisco. And 22 people flew up for the one day tour of San Francisco. Um, this is an invitation, uh, handmade, handcrafted, to the faculty dinner. And the faculty dinner was an event that started in 1947. And the last mention I could find of it was a cocktail party for faculty in 1978. So it went for over 30 years. And to foster cooperation between fine arts board members and faculty, was the, the goal of the dinner, and it was always, quote, a delightful evening with these handcrafted invitations. That's a little bit of a pop-up uh, element on the bottom. And there was frequently a hat theme with fancy hats made for special people. And in this slide, it, it looks like a Mardi Gras festival, but it is uh, a dinner honoring three special people. Frederick Hard, whom we remember. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, OK, I sh need to. I'm sorry, technologically advanced, I'm not. Um, Frederick Hard was retiring that year, so they had this 
extravaganza done for him. This was Betty Wood, um, after whom the, and we never knew they were called the Elizabeth Monroe Wood Steps. We thought they were the Miss America Steps, the ones out here, if you all know those, but they were named after Betty Wood. And this is Doug McClellan. I think he was going up to UC Santa Cruz that year, but um, th that was one of the photographs taken at the 1964 party. And at the 1968-69 party, there were 43 guests. The hostess, the hostess provided paper cocktail napkins, dinner napkins, and cigarettes. <laughs> And in her report, the party chair related, quote, the dinner was served buffet style and everyone ate everywhere. No games were played. Name tags were used. The bar was set up in the kitchen slash breakfast area and the hostess provided a bartender. The, um, I'll describe these people later. The catered dinners that evening in 68 were $4.25 a piece. And the group of 43 guests uh, consumed three quarts of bourbon, three quarts of gin, one quart of vodka, and two quarts of scotch. And she, the, the chair ended her report with, a fine party spirit prevailed the entire evening. <laughs> So I think with how many, eight bottles of, anyway. Uh, oh, I have this thing. Okay, does anybody know this gentleman? It's, it's hard to see, I'm sorry. This is Albert Stewart, and this was just a couple of months before his death. Um, this was Vivian Destronel, who taught English, and she, they, well, they all have these fancy hats. This is Toddy Stewart and Mark Stewart, and he looks absolutely mortified to be dressed up like that, doesn't he? Um, this is Betty Dyke. I think this is the, the president at the time, and her, um, Mrs. Walker, maybe? And this, another picture of Betty Wood. I think Betty Wood was quite the party girl. I think I, we would have all enjoyed having her as a member. Um, Another project that the Fine Arts Foundation took on, and it began in 1947, was the limited edition series. I could not figure out when that ceased. In the very sketchy minutes we have from the late 90s and early 2000s, there is mention of limited editions, but I do believe the limited edition series uh, stopped before that. If anyone knows if there are, if there's, I think there's a complete set of limited editions over as uh, in the custody of the gallery. If anyone knows where there is a catch of um, limited editions, particularly prints and flat pieces, I think that would be a, a wonderful thing to know. Anyway, these are all artists who made limited editions for the Fine Arts Foundation over the years between 1947 and probably 87 at the latest, but maybe, maybe later than that. Um, from left to right is Arthur Ames and his wife Jean Ames, and they are admiring Rick Pedersen throwing this pot. And this is Allie Pedersen. Rick and um, Phil Dyke and Betty Dyke. Uh, Phil Dyke had made several uh, prints for the Fine Arts Foundation limited edition. Um, Allie Pedersen made glass plates. Um, Rick did some ceramics. Jean did both prints and some other, um, I think she did an enamel, a copper cover and enamel. And I'm not sure Arthur Ames, I think he may have done some prints, but I'm not sure. Does anyone have at least one Fine Arts Foundation limited edition in their home? Okay, yeah. We have Phil Dyke. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Phil Dyke. Did anybody have the Jim Fuller quails? Yes. Yes? Yes, and the Sue Hertel cats. I wish we could find some 
extra copies of some of those and sell them for a very nice contribution to the scholarship <laughs> fund. Um, Oh, I was talking about limited editions. Um, Millard Sheets actually did the first one in 1947. It was a lithograph. And it was, again, he worded it, we are giving you this opportunity to have, um, to have a splendid piece of art crafted by a notable scripts artist or someone else, and you only need to pay such and such for this opportunity. So um, I love Millard Sheets. Uh, Sue Hertel also did a limited edition. This is her tapestry that is now hanging behind the podium in the Hampton Room up in the Malott Commons. That was in the president's office then. Um, in 1948, the Fine Arts Foundation undertook a cinema series. And I think we forget now that, that when you turn your TV on, you can get Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime, and it's all there and the on demand, and you can get practically any movie you want. But in 1948, things were a little less available. And so the Fine Arts Foundation decided that they would show films. This is uh, from about a decade later. And, mo and some of these films are um, American. I, I, I'm sorry you can't really read that. Um, it, was, it was a way to raise money for art scholarship programs. And there were eight to 10 movies a year and they sold season tickets and in 1955 a season ticket for the 8 to 10 films was three dollars <laughs> and there there were 180 seats in Balch Auditorium and that's where the films were shown and a gentleman named William Blanchard, Dr. Blanchard, who was the organist at Pomona College. Um, and at Fox Theater in Pomona. Was he really? Well, he apparently was a real film buff and had worked in the industry when he was younger. Um, and he was um, the acting manager, the projectionist, at, pro projectionist, and the publicity man. And he was very very involved in the cinema theory, series. He had a deal with the Village Theater downtown that they would not show any of these films during the year they were shown at Scripps, but they would get a plug at Scripps for the, the films they were showing. So that worked out pretty well, I think. Here is a list, and I'm sorry again that it's not readable. Uh, apparently, the uh, Films were very popular and well attended. They came to an end in 1963 after the 15 years due to competition for movies on TV. Who would have thought it? Um, new developments in technology rendered the equipment that fine arts had purchased obsolete. And although townspeople at first were the major audience for these films, students later predominated and they sort of came and went and they were always studying or on vacation or something. So um, they lost interest and volunteers became tired of, of working on this project. Um, I think so many or many projects that organizations undertake just sometimes live a natural life and then are superseded by something else. Um, what superseded the cinema series as a fundraiser for scholarships was the uh, rental gallery. And this is an invitation to everyone to come to a cocktail party at the president's house to launch the uh, rental gallery. And um, I was going, it's quite a long poem, it, another Richard Armour poem that he wrote. I'll read the first stanza and the last. Um, 
And Richard Armour says, what if the art on your walls is faddish, a bit bizarre and a trifle maddish? What if your paintings, instead of Rococo, are to most observers a little loco? <laughs> yes, what if your pictures and sculpture and pots look like something dragged in from a used car lot? Well, little you care if it looks demented, for you don't own it, it's only rented. Um, and at the and he goes on and talks of uh, he weaves a lovely story about renting art for your home from the Scripps Rental Gallery. And he says, hail then to the start of the renting of art. May your instincts be properly goaded. I hope that your wall and your tables and all, and you for that matter, are loaded. So, <laughs> Um, the rental gallery was really, it was quite an ambitious undertaking. Does anyone remember that? It was from 1963 to 68, and it was a very ambitious project. Um, it needed contracts, it had to have insurance, they had to have volunteers. Um, it was in and here's one snapshot view of, of the rental gallery. It started off just having paintings the first year. It was in the small gallery off the lower level of the Oriental Court um, of Lang. And it was open four to five days a week, uh, 800 hours a year. And it was, it was quite limited, but volunteer staffed. The first year, only the paintings by Scripps faculty, Paul Darrow, Dyke, Hertel, McClellan, Scott, Sheets. Over a five-year period, it expanded to ceramics, wall hangings, prints, and sculptures. Um, you could rent a piece for three months, and the rental price was applicable to the purchase price. The price was on a sliding scale. For example, if the painting was worth $50 to $100, you paid $9 for three months to rent it. And $12 for three months if the value was $101 to $300. And it went up to $30 for three months if the value of the piece was $601 to $1,000. And artists re received a third if rented and 75% of the sales. And other proceeds went to scholarships. So it was quite the um, fundraising and it was quite successful. The, if anyone's interested in, in the list of the 1967 pieces that were for rent, I, I have it in my bag. It's quite fascinating. There are many, many local artists, including some from LA, who, who rented or who furnished their pieces to be rented out. Um, it closed abruptly, unfortunately, in uh, December of 1968 due to a change in insurance. It was just overnight uh, the insurance policy expired and they had to close down because it could not it could not be renewed uh, the then president referred to quote the enthusiasm and zeal of the volunteers and members and called it an outstanding success it the as a fundraiser the rental gallery was replaced by a series of really blockbuster benefits that some of you may remember Oh, okay. This is an invitation to something they called Phantasmagoria. And it was in 1970, and it made for 1970 a $6,000 profit. Um, you can't see everything on this. If from 11 to a.m. to 5 p.m. there were there were house tours and the um, the houses were the armors um, the dykes Winfield Foster and his wife the Garrison's home in Padua another home in Padua owned by the Sterlings and Hoppy Stewart's house um, this invitation is probably this long opened up and about this tall so it folds up and you could send your money back or your yes you could send your money back and on the right hand side it advertises um, what is going to happen from five to eight which will be fantasy 
that is not explained. Um, objet d'art sale, an art raffle, music and light, and Armour autographs. Apparently, Richard Armour was going to autograph some of his books. There was also a cocktail party. Um, this is a photograph from a, a newspaper clipping. Um, photographing the original was extremely impossible. Um, this is a, a scene, a photograph of a scene from Alice in Wonderland, which was being presented then by Siddons or by the, the uh, drama group. And it happened to be quite appropriate because, of course, there was a mad hatter in this Alice in Wonderland. And to make it even more sort of interesting, here, uh, this is Alice and some of the other characters. This is the Mad Hatter, who was played by a young CMC student whose name was Robin Williams, oh. who became Robin Williams. Uh, or actually, he was known as Rob Williams at CMC. Um, so I thought you all might get a kick out of knowing that Robin Williams, th that must have been part of the light and s music. I don't know. Uh, the next year, they did this um, benefit entitled, um, excuse me, Saturnalia Victoriana Scripsiensis. <laughs> well, it's sort of an Art Deco poster, but it was uh, it celebrated the Victorian period. And it was a tribute to the Victorian era with minstrels, a maypole, musicians, sale of Victorian items donated by fine arts members, and a gala champagne supper. And they really went all out to raise money after the, the rental gallery closed. And last but not least of the efforts to stimulate public interest in art in Claremont um, was the docent program, which began in 1967. I don't know if they were docents or not, but I didn't have any other pictures, so pretend they're docents. Don't they look like they're explaining something about that painting? Um, it, it was established to give elementary school classes an opportunity to visit exhibits at Scripps and to learn about the objects that they were seeing. It was later extended to high school students and adults. Uh, they had 600 plus students for many of their exhibits. And some of the classes returned to school and created their own exhibits based on what they had seen here. About 20 volunteers a year were guided by art historians and artists, and they read articles and books and were very knowledgeable about art. These were all Fine Arts Foundation members who volunteered. There was an incident I w in, in one of the notebooks is a letter from a art faculty member uh, to the president of the Fine Arts Foundation complaining that one of the docents, and to please not let it happen again, one of the docents apparently disapproved of a piece that was on display that was being shown to school children and th didn't think it was appropriate, so apparently she turned it around. Oh. And, <laughs> and this art faculty member was very upset that um, it, it was meant to be that way and you should leave it that way. Please, don't let it happen again. The um, Fine Arts Foundation was the hat club. These are wonderful hats from the 50th anniversary. Um, I really think after doing the research I've done, and I haven't done, I haven't looked at every single piece of material in the archives, I could probably be proven wrong, but I think what I have seen only reinforces my theory that the Fine Arts Foundation was as important as any institution or individual in bringing art to Claremont, to making Claremont 
a center for creativity in the 50s and 60s and 70s. I know that artists in Claremont attracted other artists after the Second World War, but I think that the Fine Arts Foundation, through its programs, attracted the public to art. They certainly provided scholarship funds for Scripps students to become artists and I think have over the last 80 years and pat yourselves on the back have done a fantastic job of introducing and spreading a love of art to, to the public in general. Thank you and the end. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. What about the haunted house? Oh. <laughs> the, um, it's just an, it's, um, the last five or so years I was here at Scripps, um, students kept telling me about incidents of seeing ghosts. Uh, <laughs> And there are some, most of what is haunted are dormitories, are the residence halls. Um, how, and I think that uh, because students live together in residence halls, that's where their spirits return. Scripps and Pomona College have spirits and um, ghosts. None of the other colleges do. Uh, I, I, there may, so I kept being asked to talk about this, and I, and my, my late husband used to say, Judy, that's all you're going to be remembered for in Scripps College are the ghosts. Um, but someone. Hmm? You said to talk about the. History. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I'm going to tell the story. Um, there was a. a meeting of women in the development office uh, to talk about fundraising. And one of them heard someone out in the hallway, maybe looking through mail, something. She turned around and she saw a man with a navy blue button up the front sweater with his hands in his pockets. And she turned to the woman beside her and, but his hands this way in his pockets, not this way. And she turned to the woman beside her and said, who is that? And they both turned around, he was gone. And so, as I always do with the ghosts, I try to re relate it to real things, real incidents at the college. So I talk about, but I immediately, when she said he had his hands in his pockets this way, thought about President Jaqua and this spirit was in the old president's house. Anyway, you can decide for yourselves whether <laughs> Scripps is haunted or not. Was there a question back there? Hi, Catherine. Um, are you going to cut out the big, the gigantic scrapbook? Um, we talked about it. Yes, we're going to, I'm glad we didn't bring it out because it would have been sat upon. <laughs> but but uh, yes, we are. And also the, the 85th 50th, little uh, 50th anniversary from 85. Yeah. Yes. Why, why was it called the Hat Society or Hat Group or whatever? Well, you know, I, because, well, at the time, um, in 1930, women wore hats. Um, but when I was doing the research on the faculty parties, there was, um, talk about hat themes. Now, whether it already had the reputation of being the hat club um, and people were urged to wear fancy hats to the faculty parties, but the faculty parties didn't start until 1947. And I, I don't know which came first, but um, whether it was encouraged and sort of promulgated by the faculty or whether um, they really took advantage of its um, sort of reputation. Well, of being. I heard that was Miller's pet name for the Fine Arts Foundation employment. Well, so Miller called them the hat club. He prob I, 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 
absolutely support that <laughs> observation. <laughs> I, yeah, I think he, that's something that he probably would have enjoyed talking about. Yeah. Yes? Well, I like Paul Darrow's work because I think when I was a script girl, I thought all the Fine Arts Foundation people looked like that, and Lord knows what they think we <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, that's again from the um, from the fiftieth anniversary. I don't think you all are really comfortable in those chairs. Why don't we go out to the um, to the courtyard and have some tea? <laughs> and um, maybe we could flick the lights on. Is there a ghost back there? Uh, ooh. So.